I'm Jerry Kirsch. I'm uh, the Special Assistant for Global Health to President Brown um, and advisor to the uh, Center for Global Health and Development at Boston University. And I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of the university and our partners in organizing this, my colleagues at uh, Harvard, uh, in particular Linda McDonald and Julio Frank from the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, and uh, the um, Harvard uh, Initiative in Global Health. Um, in uh, Boston University, Adil Najam, who's the director of the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future, and John Simon, who's director of the Center for Global Health, and most importantly, the people who made this uh, both possible and necessary, um, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which has produced uh, the report that we are here to discuss. Two um, minor things, I'd also like to welcome the 40 or so people who are registered online. Uh, thank you for coming. And we do have a mechanism, unknown to me, um, to accept your questions for later on, but I will find out when uh, you do ask your questions. I'd ask everybody in the room, if you have a cell phone, turn the ringer off. Everybody forgets to do that, and I just remembered to do that myself. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, John Douglas from uh, Boston University School of Public Health um, for all of the work he's done in uh, organizing, and Emily Poster from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. This um, is a la... Uh, public radio, a conversation in three parts. Um, we're here to discuss this report that was issued by the commission, and three of the commissioners are sitting to my left and your right, and I will introduce them in a moment. Um, the Commission on Smart Global Health Policy for a Healthier, Safer, and More Prosperous World. The report was issued last month, and this is, I think, the first public discussion of of the report, and particularly relevant in this area um, where we have so much academic activity related to public, to global health. Um, a lot of our private sector biotech and pharma uh, companies are addressing um, issues of global health. Um, and uh, the dialogue between these two sectors and with our political leadership, Representative Mike Capuano uh, should be here shortly. Uh, is an essential part of, of what we do and what we do for a living. Uh, and um, we have many resources to put to the issues of global health if we knew what it was that we should be doing. And so this conversation is in part trying to figure that out. Act one um, is a presentation of the report by the commissioners. And again, I'll introduce the three in a moment. Act two is a discussion amongst academic leadership. Um, we have President Bob Brown from Boston University and Steve Hyman, provost at Harvard. Two of our colleagues from uh, the private sector, Phil Dormitzer from Novartis uh, and Jim Garrity from Genzyme, uh, and uh, Representative Capuano, and that will be moderated by Adil Najam. Um, and Act Three, um, probably the most important, is a panel of uh, five students from Dartmouth, um, Brown, Yale, Harvard, and Boston University. Um, and a sixth panelist, Joel Lamstein, who is a perennial student, but also the president of John Snow uh, International here in Boston. Um, and uh, that will be moderated by David Hunter from uh, the Harvard School of Public Health. So there's much to cover uh, in the course of the morning. Um, we really want to ask the commissioners um, questions. Uh, I think we want to focus on did they get it right? And if so, how do we implement what they have talked about in their report? If we think they got it wrong, we need to tell them so that we can make the, you know, the necessary course corrections. Um, and uh, engaging in this conversation, I'm pleased to say, is a group of high school students who are interested in global health um, from Cushing Academy and some from uh, Boston University Academy. Um, and they are the next, next generation. Our student panel is the next generation. Um, and uh, we are the present. They are the future. The uh, three commissioners who are uh, joining us 
and will speak uh, in this order um, to uh, present to you the report, um, the uh, nature of the process that they were engaged in. Uh, Peter Lamptey, who is the president of public health programs at Family Health International uh, in Research Triangle. Um, Peter began his career as a medical officer in Ghana. Um, he was responsible for preventive and clinical health services for just 200,000 people. Um, he has been involved in major um, programs supported by USAID addressing the uh, global AIDS epidemic, um, and uh, now is responsible for FHI, which is another major NGO working in the global health space um, on development and health programs. He has a, an MD degree from the University of Ghana, an MPH from UCLA, and a doctorate in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. So welcome, Peter. Nice to have you here. Um, a second uh, of the commissioners who will be speaking is Senator uh, Jean Shaheen. Um, she was formerly the governor of New Hampshire from 1997 to 2003, and now is uh, in the uh, US Senate. Um, she's had multiple roles in all sides of, uh, of health care and delivery. It's hard to find somebody who is more knowledgeable than um, the senator uh, in uh, dealing with the kinds of issues now applied not domestically but in the international context. Um, she was at one point uh, the director of the Harvard um, Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School of Government. So thank you for coming, Senator Shaheen. So everybody has a, some contact with uh, Boston and the Boston area. Um, <clears throat> Karen Remley is the uh, commissioner of the Virginia Department of uh, Health. Um, as such, she is the chief health advisor to the governor um, and the uh, Virginia General Assembly and the State Board of Health. Um, it's a large uh, program, um, over $500 million and over 4,000 employees. Um, which provides public health services through the health departments and uh, throughout the state. Um, she has an extensive background in, in health and, um, and health care as well. Um, she is a pediatric emergency room uh, physician, which she did for uh, many years, um, and uh, is in particular the mother of a daughter who's over at MIT and across the, the river. And so she welcomed the opportunity to come to Boston to address you and incidentally to have a chance to say hello to her daughter who is in the room somewhere here. So um, with those introductions, thank you all for coming. Um, we will do que a question and answer period after they've had a chance to explain things to you. There should be some index cards at the tables. If you um, have a question, we think the most efficient thing is to, is to write it out on a, on a card. We are pressed for time. Um, write it out on a card and one of our student volunteers will pick it up and, uh, and we'll go from there. So thank you very much and you're on. Okay, thank, thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'm delighted to be one of the representatives together with my colleagues, uh, Senator and uh, Karen, uh, to be representative of the CIS Commission on Smart Go Global Health Policy today. Uh, as you heard, I'm also here as an alumni of Harvard a long-time contributor to global health at FHI, and also to offer a developing country perspective. When I arrived in Boston in 1978 to study for my doctorate in public health, I was like many of you here. I was looking for an education that would prepare me for a career in global health. My time in Boston not only accomplished that, but it also helped shape my future in global health. We are the commission believe that the time has come for the U.S. policymakers to, to develop a smart global health strategy that addresses 21st, 21st century challenges and gets better results for the world's poorest people, as well as the U.S. taxpayer. And this plan is for the next 15 years. Um, the U.S. has also driv uh, driven remarkable global health progress over the last decade. Millions of the world's poorest people are now receiving life-saving AIDS treatment, living free from the threat of malaria, and avoiding the crippling effects of measles and polio. We need to consolidate 
and accelerate these impressive achievements. The Center for Strategic and International Studies Commission on Smart Global Health Policy brought 25 high-level, diverse American opinion le leaders uh, together to develop a new U.S. approach, which we believe can help uh, save lives of the world's uh, poorest uh, people. The Commission held consultations in Washington, traveled to Kenya to assess the impact of U.S. investments in the country, obtained valuable input from the White House, State Department, Human Health Services, and especially uh, CDC and, and uh, National Institute of Health, and visited California Bay Area as well as the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina to engage global health institutions, including students, in, in the area. The Commission's uh, strategy or recommendation has five pillars that we urge U.S. Policy policymakers to adopt as they maintain ongoing dialogue with the American people to, Im uh, to improve uh, global health uh, investments uh, and as well as the lives of the people living in those countries. Number one, maintain U.S. commitment to fight global HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. In order to end the threat of TB resistance, eliminate malaria deaths, and reduce HIV, new HIV infections by uh, two-thirds uh, by the year 2015. Second recommendation, prioritize women and children to build stronger families and communities, namely to reduce the uh, 2.6 million deaths uh, that occur in newborns in the first month of life, also reduce the uh, eliminate 3 million uh, maternal deaths as a result of pregnancy and childbirth, and also reduce uh, by 2 million deaths on the uh, five years, uh, children of five years old uh, in developing countries. The third recommendation is to bolster prevention for emerging diseases uh, in poor countries. And this includes a wide range, the neglected tropical diseases, chronic disease, for example, that now account for uh, about 35 million deaths uh, worldwide, 80% of which are in developing countries. Recommendation number four, strengthen the U.S. government's organization structure to make health, uh, health investments more effective, accountable, and transparent. And one of the key recommendations uh, uh, is to increase U.S. investments from $10 billion a year to $25 billion a year by the year 2025. Last recommendation, make smart investments in multilateral institutions to demonstrate U.S. leadership and catalyze increased support for global health from other countries as well. This is a key recommendation since for, even though we've been talking about this for decades, uh, most of the investments from um, Europe, U.S., uh, and other countries are uncoordinated and often lead to dupl duplication and ineffective use of these resources. Lastly, what is the value of this report from a developing country perspective? There are five key issues. One is the longer-term policy and funding com commitment. Uh, the co uh, Commission recommends 15-year cycles rather than the fi current five years, since most of our health problems don't have a five-year cycle. <clears throat> Second, leveraging and coordination of bilateral and multilateral donors is a key recommendation that will benefit uh, uh, the countries involved and will, uh, as I said earlier, improve the effect effectiveness and efficacy uh, of the investments. Third, increase in the funding levels. Uh, currently, um, the $5 billion per year uh, uh, that is uh, put in does not, account, uh, does not meet uh, um, the, 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 sorry, the $5 billion we're currently investing in is only scratches the surface in terms of the, uh, the extent of the problem. Uh, HIV treatment uh, is still uh, only 25% of those who need treatment as I mentioned, chronic disease has not been, been, been touched. Maternal mortality continues to be high, uh, and there are several other health outcomes that we need to address. 
The fourth is focus, focusing on broader set of health priorities. Um, are key if uh, developing countries are to address uh, the uh, key issues of morbidity of uh, m uh, mortality. And then the last comment uh, that makes uh, improves developing country capacity uh, to address uh, broad health and developmental issues is the, the recommendation that these uh, should be country-led and country-owned uh, efforts, and this is an important uh, recommendation that we believe will improve uh, the investments that we are putting in developing countries. We at the Commission believe that these recommendations will significantly improve the lives of the poorest people living in developing countries. Thank you. Um, thank you. Peter's done an excellent job of summarizing what's in the report. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here in Boston. It's always fun to come down from New Hampshire. And as you know, you heard, I spent some time at the Kennedy School at Harvard, so it's nice to have BU and Harvard sponsoring this event today. I also want to recognize the Dartmouth students who are in the audience. Where are you, Dartmouth? Okay, good. We're glad to have you here. Um, and. Unfortunately, I'm going to miss the student panel later this morning, but how many students, um, public health, medical students, um, students are here involved in healthcare in some capacity or interested in it? Raise your hand. Hi, so we can see you. Um, I think it's really exciting to see how many of you are here this morning because I think your generation as a whole, much more than my generation, um, understands the global world that we're living in and appreciates the importance of investing in global health. Um, I, I'm going to just talk very briefly about three points that I think we ought to think about as we're thinking about Congress and policy making. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the recommendations in the report because you can read those, but um, the President, as many of you know, has talked about a six-year global health initiative. I think the CSIS report does a wonderful job of supporting what the Obama administration is talking about and taking it another step farther, talking about the importance of making this a long-term strategy. But as we think about how do we engage Congress and get policymakers to appreciate why this is important to everybody, um, there are three points that I want to make. First of all, We've got to engage the public as a whole in this discussion, and the report talks about that. And polling shows that generally the public does support global health efforts. Um, when they hear the stories about the difference that it makes in people's lives, they're supportive of that. Unfortunately, we don't tell those stories enough. We had uh, Bill Clinton and um, Bill Gates before the Foreign Relations Committee not too long ago, and one of the things Bill Gates talked about is the effort on their website called Living Proof to talk about the stories of the successes from global health and the investments there. And so we've got to do more of that. One of the other concerns the public has is that they think we spend a whole lot more money on these initiatives than we really do. Right now we're spending one quarter of one percent of our public dollars in the United States on public health, um, global health initiatives. Um, we need to let people know that, let people know that we're getting a good bang for our buck. And even if we look at um, the increased investment that the Obama administration is asking for in this year's budget, it's only 9.6 billion, it's up 8% over the previous year. And even when we get if we get to the recommendation in the report, 25 billion by 2025, that's still only going to be a very small percentage of what we're spending. So this is a good buy, um, and we need to let people know about it. Secondly, we need to make sure that these efforts continue to be bipartisan. One of the real benefits of the PEPFAR program was that it had bipartisan support, and historically, um, Foreign policy initiatives have had bipartisan support in Congress, 
But as we know, with an increasingly partisan atmosphere in Washington, um, maintaining that bipartisan support for whatever we do is going to be critical. And finally, I, I think we need to point out to policymakers that investments in global health are a good buy. Now, as I said when we had Bill Clinton before the Foreign Relations Committee, one of the things he talked about is the need to make sure that we're being as efficient with our global health dollars as we can be. And I think we all understand the importance of that, especially right now, given the budget constraints that we have in Washington. But again, that's why this is such a good buy, because there is a direct correlation between national security and global health and the investments that we make in global health. Um, I thought President Clinton put it very well at that hearing when he said he was talking about going into a small village in Tanzania and they expected a couple of hundred people to turn out and 2,000 people turned out when they were announcing a new health initiative. And he said it's very simple, you know. When you're talking about the future health and security of somebody's children, they're a lot less likely to attack you. <laughs> and that's the connection that we have to make, um, not only for policymakers, but for the public. This is a good investment, and we need to sell it that way. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheehan. And I have to be honest and say I've got a daughter who's at Harvard, too, who went to Dartmouth. So I feel like we have way too many connections with this with this city, and I, I spend more money on Newberry Street than I ever thought I would. Um, my role is to really try and make the connection. If you notice, Senator Sheehan corrected herself when she said public health, and then she switched to global health. But I would make the case, and if you read through the different initiatives that um, come out in the commission, that global health is domestic health, and we just passed the largest health care reform bill in the history of our country. Um, still not a lot of money in there for public health, but public health domestically and public health globally are completely connected. And I think that's something, especially for those of you that are interested in to go into this field, don't think about an either or choice. Think about how you do work that goes forward. And the reason why I bring that up is, as Commissioner of Health for the, city, for the state of Virginia, people think about what I do for people, but I'm also in charge of clean water, um, sewage, uh, restaurant inspections, um, you know, how many countries in the world can you eat safely in a restaurant, but what impact does that have on human health? Um, inspecting and making sure that hospitals and healthcare facilities are safe and effective and follow certain criteria. So that's all part of building a sustainable healthcare system, which is something we really saw when we went to Kenya. Many of you saw the, the video as you were waiting the Kibura. Um, as you walked around, what you noticed is there's a very elegant and simple solution for community health workers, but we need to expand that <coughs> to include community water workers, community sewage workers, community road workers. It's all part of having that health system that's intact in that community. Um, as I was in Kabura in August, um, being you know the queen of H1N1 for my state for the last year, I kept saying to Peter, geez, if it comes here, it will just jump from house to house to house, and it could be very disastrous because people are so close. Um, you don't have water to wash your hands, cover your cough, do all those things we talked about. Um, and then we went on to the World Health Organization this fall and went to a very elegant emergency operations center to look at where emerging diseases would be coming from and to try and get ground truth and share that information internationally. And what you quickly realized is you can be in the most elegant, sophisticated room in the world, but if the people on the ground don't have the tools or the knowledge to be able to be those, what I call CSI public health detectives, you're not going to be able to get that kind of information. So again, that need for not just a vertical disease-specific programs, as, which we do wonderful around HIV, malaria, and TB, but really building the healthcare system. And then I don't know how many of you read the Wall Street Journal, but it was very timely. On Friday, um, there was a full-page article titled, Bill Gates Rethinks the War on Polio amid new outbreaks. And um, Bill Gates um, very, very admirably has donated a lot of money and worked very closely with Rotary International for years to try and really stop polio. And the goal for all of us, remember, was for 2010 for polio to be gone. 
We still have a lot of polio in four countries, India, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And one of the things he talks about in this article is realizing that just a vertical response, just looking at one disease, was no longer going to be the answer because he would go to villages in Nigeria where they had polio vaccine, but none of the other childhood vaccines. Um, so polio is transmitted by mouth to fecal roots. So if a child gets rotavirus and has diarrhea, they're much more likely to, again, spread from place to place. If you don't have good um, sewage treatment, if you don't have good basic public health, um, you really can't fight one disease at a time. So they're rethinking um, at the Gates Foundation what phase two of this polio campaign will be. Um, so I think it's important for us to think of it that way. And then I'm going to give you an example. Um, when we looked at H1N1 this year, um, many of you would realize that uh, in, it seemed like, I think the, the Wall Street Journal title was H1N1, was it all a big fizzle? Um, and I would tell you that it was an amazing feat of science and of public health in our country to have a vaccine developed in less than four months, to get it to people, to get it safely into people's arms, and to have very few deaths in our country relative to what could have happened because we have this incredible health care system. But right now in Central and East Africa, there are large amounts of H1N1. When a lot of small children and pregnant women are dying. And what's one of the problems? Many, many countries have donated vaccine, made pledges for vaccine. But how do you get the vaccine from the donation from a facility in Western Europe who makes it into the arms and noses of people in small villages in East Africa. We don't have the sustainability of those systems yet to make that work. And so I'll leave you with one last very pragmatic approach. Dulles Airport is in Virginia. And Dulles Airport has thousands of people coming from, from hundreds of countries every day. And they all bring with them what? Before they can come into the country, they've got to go through passport control. Pretty straightforward. You either you have your passport or you don't have your passport. But there is no way for me to adequately surveil those people to find out what diseases they may be bringing into our country or, in return, what diseases we may bring into their country. So in this time of very fluid movement of people back and forth around the world, it's going to be very important for all of us, regardless of where we live, that we develop a very safe, structured health system in the countries that we go to and visit. So I think um, it's kind of a, another perspective of why it's important to follow the Commission's recommendations. And I think the specific areas around emerging diseases, preparedness, and building sustainable systems are going to be very important for the next 15 years. Thank you very much. So if people have questions, please write them down on the cards and, and hold them up. But in the meantime, to um, kick things off, um, I actually thought I would have uh, more uh, issues to take with the Commission's report, although most of what you said you, I think you've got right. I think there are a few pieces that are missing, um, one of which I just to mention is that um, I'm all in favor of maternal and child health programs. I think empowering women is extraordinarily important. But if you ignore the guys, you've got real problems. And we are the center of the problem. And you cannot ignore us. You've got to be focused on families. And families hopefully include a, a male who needs work, who needs to feel like he also has some power and, is, uh, and, and people pay attention to him. But uh, while I'm waiting for these questions to come up, and let's do it quickly, um, uh, is um, how are we actually going to implement these recommendations? You have laid out a broad set of, of issues that, if unimplemented, will go the way of, of many previous initiatives. Um, got a nice book, um, and it'll sit on somebody's shelf. And um, how are we going to do this, and how are we going to do it in a sustainable manner? Whoever would like to tell us how we're going to do that. Yeah. Um no, that's obviously uh, is. Oh, no, first let me uh, comment on your first point about male involvement. I, I think there's no doubt at all that it has to be the whole family, it has to be the community. Uh, you can't take one member of the family and try and improve their lives without impacting, uh, uh, trying to change the lives of uh, other people. So the, the, the male involvement uh, is critical. But on, uh, it's obviously going to be a challenge to uh, to change the, uh, the investment or funding environment, especially uh, because of the economic crisis, because of the, uh, the multiple wars that we are involved in, 
Um, so that's, that's going to be, but as the uh, senator said, if you consider that uh, the U.S. is obviously the richest country in the world, and you compare the U.S. to Europe, Europe's investment in uh, global health, uh, I think there are only a handful of countries in Europe that actually are able to contribute about 1% of their GDP. And as the senator mentioned, I think you said one quarter of 1%. Right. Okay. So that's the first point <coughs> that uh, we have to market. We have to uh, convince the American taxpayers that these investments are worthwhile. Uh, these investments eventually will benefit the global village. Um, we also have to uh, convince the, the new generation of global health uh, workers to, to make sure that this is an argument that we continue to make. Uh, bipartisanship is important uh, for this, but it has to be the taxpayer eventually who uh, convinces uh, the, the U.S. government these investments uh, are, are worthwhile. So uh, I think this, uh, Senator O'Karen. Well, I would just point out again that um, given the President's current global health initiative, there is already an effort underway to begin to implement a number of the things that are in the report, um, and they bolster each other. Um, but the challenge is really the one that I talked about that um, Karen and Peter both raised uh, somewhat in their remarks, and that is how do we get the money to do this long term, and and that's where the real challenge comes in. And I think making making the case to the American people about why this is a good investment is important, but also making sure that people understand that we're being efficient with the dollars that are being spent, transparent, that there is accountability, that we can we keep data on what the successes are and where the differences have been because of those investments are all going to be critical in ensuring that long term the public and the Congress are going to support this kind of initiative. And I think from my perspective, um, two of the, the key points are as we look at emerging diseases and preparedness for our country, um, Department of uh, the Assist Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response at HHS right now is talking about a national health security strategy. So the first time we heard her talk about that to the Federal Emergency Management um, and to the Department of Homeland Security, we said it needs to be global health security strategy. So to start to look at how do you take federal funding for national programs and have people think of them as really being global programs. As we look at in, uh, and you can tell I spent way too much time recently reading the many hundreds of pages of the Health Care Reform Act, as we look at how do we provide education for more, more health care workers and innovative health care workers in our rural parts of our country, how do we combine that with a global perspective so we no longer have this artificial here's health inside the United States and here's health in the rest of the world, but we start to look at them as being interchangeable. And as we start to do that, we're gonna raise the tide in one area at the same time. I'd make the case that you can go to some parts of our country, in Virginia and very rural Appalachia, um, and you have many of the exact same problems you have in the developing world. So a lot of the solutions that we're thinking about that people here in academic institutions are doing research on are interchangeable in some ways, and we need to, make, we need to cross those lines and link that up uh, much more efficiently because it allows you to be much more creative in terms of funding. Thank you. <clears throat> a couple of interesting questions kind of summarized. Um, What's the role of engineering in making this vision a reality? It seems like it's very much an engineering systems problem uh, and not just a health problem. Who wants to take that one? I can go first because I got a daughter who's an engineer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wonder if she wrote that question. Um, clearly, it's a very good question because one of the problems in global public health for years have been we have people with a lot of medical knowledge and especially in, in the NGO world, which I spend a lot of time in, and a lot of passion, who come in and develop systems that are not necessarily integrated with the system that exists. And getting good engineering minds to come in and think about system redesign and system that makes sense within the culture of where you are, and then to start to test 
You know, that whole concept, um, Don Berwick, we talked about earlier, of plan, do, study, act, and, and looking for how do we get rid of inefficiencies with that energy mindset can really be a good way to tell the story to the American public of the success of our endeavors and to really streamline processes. But I think one of the things, one of the places where the report does make an important point is that as we're looking at um, where to make some of these investments, we need to look at countries where they have some infrastructure in, in place where there is a system um, to deliver the health care. Because without that, it's an investment that is not as efficient and doesn't provide as um, much of a positive outcome for the people we're trying to help. And, and to add to that, uh, you had the story about Gates uh, from a vertical polio program uh, and our recommendation is to broaden the scope, uh, improve the capacity. But one can even go further, that it really to address the public health and other issues, you have to go to the causes of the causes, the developmental issues. And there, there's a lot of engineering in there, improving road, road systems, uh, water, um, improving uh, uh, buildings. You, you saw the situation heard of what happened in Haiti, the collapse of uh, uh, poorly constructed buildings that led to the 200,000 plus people who died. So in looking at development, we have to look at a whole brand, a broad range of issues in order to improve health as well as other aspects of life uh, in these countries. I'm going to address this next one specifically to Commissioner Remley. Um, one of the missing points in the President's Global Health Initiative is that the approach is a vertical top-down. Do you recommend any community-based mechanism for developing these programs? Without a doubt. And I think when the, the <coughs> last, I think it's the fifth point, is the, multi, the multilateral organizations. I think when people read the report, they think of World Health Organization, they think of Gavi, they think of big organizations. But I think just as important in being a state health official, I understand that community-based engagement and research are huge. Um, and I think when we were in Kenya and visited a number of villages and saw community workers who started off saying, what does our community need? I have HIV and I know what it's like to live here. Now let us design the system around what the community needs rather than having a USAID grant say this is the system that you will implement. Um, has great value and is much more likely to be sustainable. So I think as we go forward, and I, and I can't speak for President Obama, but um, certainly on a domestic level, he's passionate about getting communities engaged in NGOs and other community organizations. You see that in the health care reform um, bill and that money is going to go to lots of different places to try and get things going. I think that same approach globally helps with the caveat that you have to build in accountability. Um, and those communities want to be accountable in a way that makes sense to them. Thank you. So, Peter, um, health of global populations cannot improve in a vacuum. What plans does the Commission have to improve nutritional status of human populations through improved livestock health and surveillance in response to emerging infections, most of which arise in wildlife and domestic animals? <laughs> yeah, actually, it relates to my previous response that uh, we can't d deal with uh, isolated public health issues. Nutrition continues uh, to be an important component uh, of health, uh, both in mothers and children. Um, and actually, the, the irony of it is that most developing countries have not solved the problem of undernutrition, and now they've added the problem of overnutrition. So you can go to households now where there's an undernourished, undernourished child, and an obese mother or obese father, for that matter. Uh, we have problems related to um, low birth weight uh, because of poor maternal nutrition. Uh, so those issues are, are definitely uh, are real and getting a lot worse. I think the solution, again, is to uh, look at the, uh, the, some of the broader causes of malnutrition, which is agricultural production, uh, uh, which is uh, produ production of cash crops instead of nutritional foods, uh, the marketing of these foods uh, to bring income to uh, families. Uh, once you improve the income of a family, you improve the education, 
a lot of these issues to be addressed. So again, going back to the point that we need to address this in a much broader context rather than taking isolated health issues uh, to try and improve upon them. And finally for Senator Shaheen, who I know um, has to leave shortly. But there were a bunch of questions about this. And here's one way of phrasing it. Over the past year, the pace of growth of treatment of HIV AIDS through antiretroviral treatment has slowed down, resulting in thousands of people being turned away from necessary treatment and increased waiting times. How do we address this? When I was at uh, the Kennedy School, we got contacted by Bono with the One Campaign, who was interested in how he could better spend the money from the One Campaign to address HIV and AIDS in Africa. And we pulled together a lunch with a number of public health and medical folks from Harvard um, to sit down with Bono. Uh, many of the, virtually all the people who were there had been working in Africa um, on this issue for a very long time. And what they all said to him is that the challenge is making sure that there is uh, a system in country for delivering um, the medications. That right now we have too few countries that actually have a system that Karen talked about that has the, the community, the village connection that can deliver uh, the medicines so that um, once, once the, the one campaign is gone, or once the USAID folks are gone, or once the PEPFAR um, people who have been in Africa to set up this program are gone, there is no system there to deliver it. So building that local capacity has to be part of um, whatever we do, whether it's for HIV AIDS or for whatever health initiative is underway. It's ultimately the people on the ground in those villages and the countries who are going to need to deliver um, the medications and the system. And we've got to help build that capacity. And, you know, that's all about, it goes back to resources, as I said um, in the beginning. It's all about how do we get the resources to get that done. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for the panel? We, 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 thank you, we thank you for taking time out of your day jobs to work on the commission, and especially for coming here and, and sharing this with us today. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite Adil Najam and panel number two. And uh, I see Representative Capuano is, has joined us. And so thank you very much. And I'll let Adil do the necessary introductions. My name is Adil Najam. I am a professor of global public policy here at Boston University and the director of the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. Uh, it's, it's a great, great, a great pleasure and honor to, uh, to, to be invited to moderate this, this wonderful panel, uh, extremely eminent panel on this extremely important topic. Uh, to, to, to delve deeper into the conversation that has already started uh, around, the, uh, around the report uh, of, of the commission. I will not go into long introductions because that will take up all our time, and we really have a really eminent uh, panel, and I hope you will look up their biographies on the, on the sheets that you have. We have also uh, agreed that instead of making, uh, in, in, uh, what we want to have here is a conversation to really follow up on the conversation that's already started and, and to talk about the role of New England uh, in terms of research and innovation and what it can contribute to smart global health policy. And what we have up here on the stage is really an eminent gathering of New England's uh, political leadership, a representation of New England's political leadership, a representation of New England's academic leadership, and a representation of New England's industry leadership. In this region, we are proud of all three. We have Representative uh, Michael Carpiano, uh, from, uh, Representative from Cambridge and Somerville, uh, no introduction needed, certainly not in this town, uh, who, who, who is joining us here. We have President Robert Brown of Boston University. Uh, we have uh, Provost uh, Steve Hyman of Harvard University. We have Phil uh, Dometzer from Novratis. 
and we have James Gerty from Genzyme. And I, as I said, I won't go into the into their detailed introductions, but they all bring an immense amount of experience. And I wanted to, uh, I, I wondered if we could start with. Uh, Representative Capuano, and as I say that, let me also invite you to please send your questions right from the beginning, because what we want to have here is a conversation, and so please keep bringing them in. And I wanted to uh, start with the congressman and maybe talk a bit about what you see as New England's role and uh, strategic advantage in the area of global health. Uh, all of us, of course, are very proud of it, but what do you see are, are the critical elements of that strategic advantage? I'm not sure I can tell you because Senator Shaheen will take all of our secrets and bring them to New Hampshire. Um, it's all of New England. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, I, I see my district in greater Boston and probably most of New England, if not all of New England. Uh, I look at it as our entire economy now is, it's interesting that you, inter you introduced two of the gentlemen as industrialists, which they are. Um, because I ask, I ask people all the time, what do you think it is that we do here? And I know how I feel. My answer is we do intellectual capital. That's what we do. We build it in our universities, we test it our, at our hospitals, and we commercialize it at our businesses. That's what we do. We do it in biotech, we do it in photonics, we do it in robotics, we do it in everything. We do it in software, we do it everywhere there is. Um, we don't make textiles anymore. And that's how this region was built. We, we don't do a whole lot of international trade in stuff. Uh, we don't build a whole lot of stuff. Stuff can be built and created cheaper in many other places in this country and in this world. And anybody who spent any time here, you might remember when this was a textile capital. Who did we lose it to? We did not lose it immediately to China and Southeast Asia. We lost it to South Carolina. And they lost it to Mexico, who then lost it to Asia who will eventually lose it to somebody. Why? Those are old technologies for the most part. They keep coming up with new ways, obviously. But they're following the cheap wage dollar. Our economy is tied to places where wages have to be higher. And they have to be higher because we need to hire and retain the best and the brightest in everything, including health care and including Healthcare policy, which I look at as one of the 10,000 things we do. And for me, the whole panoply of what we do is built around that. The universities, the hospitals. Most of our scientific businesses are related to cutting-edge materials, whatever it is they do. And we add, to, we add to that some significant business acumen when it comes to financing all of that. When it comes to cutting edge capitalism, uh, mutual funds are headquartered here. Why? Because they were created here for the most part. And they can move anywhere tomorrow, anywhere in the world. Why do they stay here? They stay here because we're at the cutting edge still. We provide a good quality of life because of high income people. It all ties in together. And I do believe that it, all, it is all mutually dependent. I don't think that we can take any of those key ingredients out. We cannot take the universities out. We cannot take the hospitals out, and the hospitals are the whole healthcare field because they are directly related. And we cannot take the capital out. Now, lately, it's in bioscience that is our latest industry. But as bioscience becomes a more mature industry, they will move when they get to become simply manufacturers. Now, my hope is that their research arm stays here, but I can't even guarantee that their research arm will exist because Capitalistic societies go back and forth between their investment and research, which is, of course, how you fall behind, but that's my presumption, not theirs. And when they mature, my hope is that our region is on to the next innovative area, whatever it's going to be, and I don't have a clue what it's going to be. If I knew that, I'd be a wonderful capitalist and I'd be in the financial <laughs> services industry. <laughs> wonderful. We will continue the discussion and maybe find out what that is. But if I could move to President Brown right, taking the cue from what the congressman said, what we do is intellectual capital. What we do is ideas. Uh, and where we do a lot of that is in universities. Uh, and, and coming from yourself from research and, and as university leadership, where do you see the strategic advantage of New England, including how do we best take this intellectual capital and these ideas and apply them 
towards better global health. Let, let me frame my remarks, uh, focus them on the issues of global health, why we gathered here this morning. Um, I see the great research universities in the New England area, especially along the Charles River, of having a tremendous competitive advantage. First and foremost, they are very international places and have been for many, many years. When you walk up and down Commonwealth Avenue uh, on the BU campus, 15% of the students that you pass are from countries other than the United States. When you meet with our undergraduates, four out of 10 of them will spend a semester abroad in one of the facilities that we operate on 22, in 22 countries. Uh, you've got today on these research university campuses a very open and informed group of people that are informed about the world. And that came up in the panel before us and it's, uh, and it's a very uh, key advantage. How does that spill over into global health? If you look on our campus today, the interest in public health and global health, and I like very much the discussion we had about how you should not separate those two issues, uh, is uh, profoundly more intense today than it was a decade ago. Uh, how do universities respond to this? Today you'll see master's programs today between the School of Public Health and the School of Management between the School of Social Work and the School of Management, trying to train leaders uh, with skills of an MBA, but also with a global health, public health perspective. You'll see on our campus today a minor in public health, which is the largest minor of any minor among our undergraduates. It's sponsored again by the School of Public Health, which is traditionally a graduate-only program, but involves students in the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of uh, health and rehabilitation sciences, essentially students from all over the campus. What you see today in these universities is the merger of a very well-informed, well-educated, worldly group of students merging with all of that energy that comes together because of the great research universities created in this country. We have a high density of these institutions, as the congressman has said. And I'll just give one last plug in terms of how this comes about and, and actually impacts global health. Uh, today, under the leadership of John Simon sitting at the far left table uh, and our Center for Global Health and Development, uh, we have a program sponsored by the Gates Foundation uh, focused on neonatal uh, health in Zambia. It's about uh, care for the umbilical cord, looking at a very inexpensive uh, hexachlor chlorohexadiene wash system. I got it right? Uh, What's that? Th uh, <laughs> later. Uh, <laughs> a wash system that can be applied to umbilical cards for newborns, replacing very traditional and not medically oriented treatments that are used in villages. Uh, it's a, uh, a, tr a clinical trial that's being done with 28,000 uh, women in Zambia which, if you look at mortality rates, could drop the neonatal mortality rate. Prediction is by a third. Right now, about 34, if I remember, infants out of every hundred, out of every thousand, die, and about 30 percent of those die of infection. Uh, the impact of something like that, done started in a university, can be truly profound on human health and on uh, on survivability in a third world country. On the other side, what you have are tremendous training experiences and intern experiences for students from public health and other fields that will be in on doing field work in Zambia around that project. This is what research universities are very good at. This is one of the key competencies we have with all of the research universities in the Boston area. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much also for raising that issue of students. And, and students, uh, universities not just as research repositories, but repositories of young people who are going to do a whole lot of things, uh, apart from their research, activism, and so on and so forth. As I move to uh, Provost Hyman, actually, uh, President Brown already began answering one of the questions we had received, uh, which was about how do we better utilize uh, the student resources, and how do we give them access to the resources so that they can be more involved. But I also wanted to come to you, especially because you are an MD, so you also bring that perspective uh, to, to the conversation in addition to the university leadership one. 
Well, let, let me begin with the students, and let me start with something that uh, probably won't be controversial in this room, but, uh, but it might be controversial in other settings, which is, depending on how you count, in the last decade, uh, between 30 and 40 percent of the graduates of uh, what's called um, elite private education have gone into financial services. And in some sense, uh, um, uh, without any comment on the uh, excitement of the last several years, one could see that as a misallocation of the talent of young people. And it's really heartening to see the number of students here uh, to hear from President Brown about the new, uh, I don't know how new, but the minor uh, at, at BU. Uh, we now at Harvard have a secondary field in uh, global health. Uh, really at the request of students, some of our largest undergraduate courses uh, now are global health courses, a course taught by uh, uh, Art Kleiman, Paul Farmer, and Jim Kim, who has moved uh, to the frozen north um, to be president of Dartmouth, uh, had to be lotteried uh, after uh, you know the fire marshal intervened uh, at, at when we filled an auditorium of 200 students. Uh, the 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 real question for all of us, uh, obviously for the students who are engaged, but for the universities, is are we going to create the kinds of career paths and opportunities that will allow uh, this uh, uh, really wonderful burst of idealism to be wedded to uh, a successful career path with uh, groups of skills that will allow students to make a difference in global health, but also to, to uh, uh, as careers change in time, uh, to have a successful and fulfilling life. And I think we are all uh, in the early experimental stages of doing this. Now, one of the things that seems to me critical from the point of view of uh, the universities um, reflects, uh, in some ways, a question that came up to Commissioner Remley about top-down silos, and it was uh, uh, touched on by uh, President Brown in talking about joint degrees. Uh, but uh, as we develop this new and emerging uh, academic field of global health, and do it in partnership with our hospitals and with uh, biotech and pharma, it's really critical that we do not recreate uh, the kind of uh, top-down silos uh, that have un unfortunately populated uh, a lot of uh, university life. Um, clearly, um, uh, disciplines in research universities, uh, an invention of German 19th century universities, have served us very, very well. Uh, but uh, when one takes a problem-based approach, which is what public health and global health are about, one needs to bring to bear a whole diverse set of solutions. Um, and as you've already heard, these involve uh, new medical technologies, uh, health systems issues, uh, all kinds of engineering, whether it's uh, developing diagnostic devices that are cheap and don't have to be refrigerated and don't need a PhD to operate, to systems engineering, um, and uh, has to take into account both the need to provide uh, affordable drugs and, and diagnostics in the developing world, but also to do it in a way that allows our commercial partners uh, to uh, make their investments back and to thrive. This extraordinarily challenging interdisciplinary effort uh, is something that, uh, that I think we in New England um, uh, really potentially have a great advantage in. Uh, we're, we're, our uh, <clears throat> reputation as chilly and siloized may have been true at some point, uh, but I think it's no longer true. I think uh, there are enormous and, and burgeoning collaborations that are occurring now, whether it's between universities which are involved in, of course, res basic research and education, hospitals which are engaged uh, very directly in healthcare delivery and the commercial sector uh, and the, 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 these have grown in many areas. I think that this gathering uh, and, uh, and the uh, intense moral pressure and real opportunity from a global health need should always remind us that uh, 
the easy short-term path of uh, top-down silos is not going to serve us in the long term and is not going to attract our students and give our students the kind of career opportunities that will allow them to make sustained lives in this very important area. So why don't I stop there? Thank you very much. I have, I have questions piling up here, but before I, in fact, some of them are already being answered, but on this notion of breaking the silos, if I could move to uh, Phil Dormitzer, uh, and, and who, who heads the um, viral vaccine research at uh, Novartis. Uh, one of the questions that had come in uh, was about how Washington State and North Carolina both have regional associations uh, to promote global health. Uh, and, and, and the question was, what about New England? Uh, and I wanted to sort of add to that, what should New England be doing in terms particularly of the industry, the pharma industry and, and the health industry in general. And if I can add just one small idea to that, do you see in reading this report that there is smart business in smart global health policy? Um, so I guess I'd, I'd take that on first by saying that in a sense we voted with our feet uh, and New England is doing something right. Uh, our US research had been based in the Bay Area and about four years ago, there was a decision that for really doing cutting edge vaccines research, we would do better in Boston because we have access to the academic institutions here, the people that work with them, and the kind of exchange that occurs. Uh, we wanted to be on the East Coast as well. For making vaccines is very much a public-private partnership. A lot of this came together when we saw the response to H1N1, where the first vaccine seed, at least a potential one, was made just across the river in a research group that was assembled in Boston in the course of just a couple of years. And so New England has done something right by gathering um, all these groups together. Now, there are other components. Our major partnership with the U.S. government has been to build the U.S. flu cell culture facility, uh, which has as its mission to be able to produce 150 million doses of vaccine uh, within, I forget exactly what it is, something like six months of, of a pandemic. And we did that in North Carolina. And that's because there you have the combination of both a labor force and land to be able to big manufacturing facility and the kind of intellectual capital. Maybe not as much intellectual capital as we have here, but it's a different combination. Not near as much. Yes, I, 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 I can agree with that. <laughs> and then when we think about other challenges in global health and how we can make vaccines not for the developed world, but vaccines for the developing world where they have to be made very, very inexpensively and that involves not only labor, but regulatory environments. We have to explore other mechanisms where we can make vaccines that the people who need them can also afford. So I think it's a, different, it's a differentiated geography. And this is the place to be for doing innovative science. The US is probably, and, and some places in Europe are the place to be for doing really high tech, cutting edge manufacturing where you need a highly educated workforce. But if you want to make, say, your uh, traditional vaccines that have to be made for pennies, that's very difficult to do here but they do have to cost pennies to be used throughout the, uh, to, in some of the areas where they need to be used. So, if, yeah. if I can move right from there to, to James Garrity of, of Genzyme, he's senior vice president there, has headed the Europe division of Genzyme and was general manager for Genzyme's cardiovascular business. The, the, the question remains sort of how do you take this research and make it useful in Kenya, not just use, useful, it is obviously useful, but affordable at the scales we are talking about to deal with the type of problems that we are talking about? Well, I think that is a very good question, and I think that is very much the role that industry can play and has to play in translating uh, academic research into actually products and therapies that can be delivered to patients who need them. And you know, at Genzyme, we've seen global health for a long time as being central to our strategic and our, and our corporate responsibility agenda. And it is because of the nature of our products and our capabilities. You know, we have products that treat life-threatening diseases that we're very proud of that are very well used by patients in the developed world. But there's only a billion people in the world who live in developed countries that have access to the products of Western medicine. There are six billion in the developing world. And so for us, as for everyone in the pharmaceutical industry today, growth in the future lies in finding ways to bring those products to those patients. But in working with those countries and working with governments and scientific and medical leaders, what you realize is they suffer from much broader public health problems. 
And if we want to be seen as a responsible partner for the health system in those countries, we have to also work on the so-called neglected diseases, the diseases that don't have a financial return, diseases like Chagas disease in Brazil or tuberculosis in China or malaria in India. And only if we are working to develop products for those diseases will we really be accepted. And the only place we're going to find novel therapies for those diseases is in the academic community here. And so we do partner. We partnered with Harvard today in a program around malaria research, taking some new work that's been developed on, uh, on sequencing the genome from the malaria parasites. And we've been talking with Jerry and Bob Meehan and others here at BU about similar kinds of collaborations. So I think industry plays a critical role in, in moving those scientific advances from research into implementation, but we also do need to work with the government, and it's, it's very good to have Congressman Capuano here. We clearly need policy support for these initiatives. There isn't, the reason these are neglected diseases is because there isn't any direct financial incentive. No one is going to make a profit developing drugs for malaria or tuberculosis or parasitic diseases. So there have been policy initiatives, some of which are referenced in this report, advanced market commitments and the, the international finance facility. But there are other mechanisms, some of which are pending in Congress today, that are actually potentially even more relevant to what we do here, like a tax credit for research on neglected diseases. Because so many of these products are so far out in the future that a kind of a, you know, a carrot, a pull mechanism, as they say in the policy world, is in many cases too far away to be effective in sustaining research. But mechanisms that can support the year in, year out cost of doing research can actually enable companies to do much more of this research and hopefully take many more of these discoveries through development into actual commercial application. Coming full circle right from there to the congressman, I have a bunch of questions here for you. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to, uh, to, to, to join the gist of them, and I hope I do justice in that. My apologies if I, if I don't. Uh, a, a couple of streams in these questions uh, are about the importance of leadership, something that the senator mentioned earlier, that leadership is critical in convincing the American taxpayer that use of our taxes on global health has benefits to us and to the globe. And uh, two sort of streams in those questions, one was about uh, your own views and your own support for PEPFAR and, and uh, whether, whether you, you would be supporting an increase in the global fund uh, on that. And the other related to that was a question about this idea of a so-called Robin Hood tax or a Tobin tax, where if we apply a very small tax to, say, financial transactions, we can raise the type of resources that might be required for uh, global issues, including those of health, and whether you have any views uh, on that. Uh, I'm, I'm very supportive of PEPFAR, but I, I think it's a mistake for people to think that there is one tax that will be universally accepted and embraced by society. I have generally never met anybody who says, please tax me. It's always, I love taxes as long as I'm excluded or as long as I get a break, or as long as I get a deduction, whatever it might be. So to think that there is one tax that somehow has a silver bullet that will, you'll start reading in the Wall Street Journal, it's a great idea. Um, if you have that, please let me know. But I have not, ever, and I've been, actually I'm a tax lawyer by training, and uh, I did, I've done a lot of tax policy over my life, and I have never heard of such a tax. Um, so to take one item and try to direct it, I think is a huge mistake. Number one. Number two is particularly from people who want to see themselves on the receiving end of a tax benefit. Um, if I, unless there is a specific credit for public health policy work, um, I would suggest you stay out of trying to pick which one. You're not going to win it. You're going to lose. I, as far as leadership goes, I want to be real clear. Politicians generally are not leaders. If you look to your politicians for leadership, you will be looking in vain most of the time. Uh, we are followers, and that is what we're supposed to be. Please be clear about that. When I run for office to represent 650,000 people, I am not saying, elect me and then do what I tell you. Now, I'd like to, but that generally doesn't lead to winning. What do we say? We try to say, elect me, and I will do whatever it is you want me to do. And some of us will stick our finger in the air and take polls on everything, and some of us will just try to listen and whatever it might be. We are generally followers. When society wants to do something, 
We will try to find a way to get that done. The health care item we just went through is exactly that. Political leaders have been talking about it for a long time. But until society was ready to elect enough people who wanted to do something dramatic on health care, nothing happened. And even when we did, we almost lost it. Because, in general, society loses its will a lot quicker than those of us on the front line. So, if you're looking for leadership, please don't. Please provide leadership. Please support politicians at every level. Let me be real clear. It is not just the president who matters. I always love this idea for Obama's health care. Oh, really? Please show me the bill that President Obama wrote in his administration. I can show it to you. The longest version of it is 10 pages. The bill was written in Congress with this president's input. It was written in the House and then the Senate and then in a conference. Leadership comes from a thousand places. It starts amongst society. If you want us to support taxation le leading to social good, you have to elect people to do it. But when society as a whole continuously elects people who say, I hate taxes, the secret to a healthy society is no taxes, that's what you will get. And you cannot act surprised. Now, I am fortunate to live on the little island of Massachusetts. And we tend to support politicians like that. But I'm sure you also on occasion read or see news from outside of the island. And that is not the case in Washington, for the most part. It is a constant struggle. So what happens? I don't know. We keep electing people to push. And on occasion, we'll get lucky. But on occasion, we will lose. And when we lose, things that we care about, and I would suggest that public health and global health is actually pretty high in the ranking. Do you really think there's a whole lot of support in rural Appalachia to send hundreds of millions of dollars to third world countries for health care? Do you really believe that? Because if you do, you're going to have to show me some proof of it. The first thing they say why are we sending millions of dollars to such and such a country? I could use it here where I live. And everybody in this room could come up with good ways for us to send $100 million right here to Boston. And it would be used very well. But it wouldn't be for global health. So, advocate for your position. Advocate for global leadership. And elect people who are willing to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leadership comes from a thousand places, maybe even hundreds of thousands, maybe even billions, like seven billion, uh, if you're talking the global population. I have a bunch of questions here, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw them out. Anyone can take them, though I think our university leaders might, might have a particular interest in this. Uh, a, I have uh, two different questions that relate to population and whether thought has been given to the population impacts of, of, of better health. I, I myself have a view on that. Healthy people actually make better population decisions generally. But, but that is one stream of questions. And the other stream of questions really here is about water. And this goes back to what was talked about in the previous panel. And, and for example, one of the questioners points out that uh, how do you really expect people to wash their hands when they don't even have clean water uh, to drink. If I may take the liberty of just a small anecdote, a couple of years ago I read a book on human security in South Asia, and the most interesting statistic that came out of that uh, was, was the following. Uh, 60 years at that time of constant war between India and Pakistan. Not one, two, three war, it was constant conflict between India and Pakistan, 60 years. Total number of Indians killed in 60 years of conflict by the Pakistan side was less than the number of children only who die because of dirty water only in one year only in the city of New Delhi only. The exact same number was true on the Pakistan side for Karachi. Now, if you're the mother of that dead child, your child is no less dead, whether he dies at the wrong end of a tap or the wrong end of a gun. 
And yet in policy as well as scholarship, as well as everything else, we speak of one death as being, a very, one death is a statistic, the other is a national tragedy. How do we create the type of leadership amongst our students and others that looks at health in that perspective? Steve. So um, water, of course, is an emerging issue for many uh, universities and I hope for uh, many aspects of industry around the United States. Harvard has made a, a joint appointment, uh, John Briscoe, between the School of Public Health and the School of Engineering, who's going to lead a water program. And I know that in a prior life, uh, Bob Brown was very involved, maybe in the current life as well, in water issues. Um, it, it's absolutely uh, uh, critical, uh, and I, I think um, you've already given us a good anecdote, uh, and I don't have uh, all that much more to say on the topic. Population, again, one of, uh, again, it's a technical topic, and we, that we're not here for an academic filibuster, but I think what's really interesting in looking at um, effective population control is uh, as women become uh, better educated, uh, as uh, they gain some control of family resources, but also as um, dehydration and diarrhea uh, and uh, preventable infectious disease kill fewer children, what one sees uh, is uh, uh, markedly declining fertility rates. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, the, the uh, global health community has a very good idea as, uh, as to the best ways to uh, um, change uh, population vectors. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, part of, I think, what we take from that, I hope we take from that, is the need not only for better health practitioners amongst our students, but better development practitioners, better engineers, better, uh, uh, better security uh, students, because it is, it, is, it is linked. I know we are running out of time, but if we have a couple of questions, can I? Add one more, and maybe anyone can again uh, take it. There are a couple of questions about uh, the importance of improving access, not just improving uh, the, the availability of, of vaccines, for example, but improving access, and what is the role of business in that, and maybe Phil can take that. But if I can also throw out one other, which either you or, uh, or, or, or maybe uh, someone else can take, it is about uh, the fact that the focus is very often on infectious disease and finding cures for infectious disease not as much on chronic disease, and what needs to be done uh, to, to shift that focus. Okay. So, so the question of access is, of course, enormous. And business has to have a role because if it comes to vaccines, we make the vaccines. So if we're not involved in uh, assuring access, it's simply not going to happen. And there are good tales and bad tales. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at what, does, what do we make, the majority of the vaccine doses that we make are actually polio. Uh, that are sold uh, very inexpensively through the world. Now, most of our revenues come from selling flu vaccines to the developed world. And when we look at the response to this past pandemic, the distribution of influenza vaccines outside the U.S. and Europe and a few other countries was just minimal. So there's clearly a huge problem in access. And that has to be a public-private partnership because uh, businesses rely on being able to make money, and if they don't, they don't survive. It doesn't mean that every activity must be equally profitable. So there are ways, there are ways to get this accomplished. In the case of polio, we clearly accomplish it very effectively. In the case of flu, we don't. And another part of it is, let's suppose this had been avian influenza. Our main customer was the U.S. government. The U.S. government would not have allowed any of it out of the country if there had been a 60% mortality rate from this infection. So, the, so there probably also has to be a, I'm making a, a, a prediction of what would happen, so I don't know that for a fact, but I think it's very likely. So there probably also has to be a real effort for increased indigenous production uh, in the countries where vaccines are needed, both to make it affordable and to ensure supply uh, in cases of crisis. So it's a complicated issue. It's going to have to be a public-private partnership. Jim, wanted to add? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we Access is critical, and we have to work with governments to provide access, developing, strengthening health systems. But as we do that, your, your second point about, you know, the relationship between infectious and chronic diseases, probably the most fundamental trend in 
public health in the developing world is indeed the transition from a primary prevalence of infectious diseases, which are actually beginning to decline, toward a primary prevalence of chronic diseases, which are on a rapid rise. And actually, it's for those diseases that the products that companies like ours make are most effective today. And by helping to provide access for those products, we can actually continue to drive the future growth of companies like ours and many other biotech companies in this community. And actually, that will provide long-term growth to this economy. So it's, it's a very virtuous cycle. You know, by helping develop access and systems in those countries that can provide those products, it comes right back here to allow us to provide more employment and more funding for research in, into this community overall. Thank you. I'll give one very last, uh, very quick question to President Brown because he'd raised this issue and the question asked was about how, you, how serious you think universities are about making global health uh, a truly interdisciplinary uh, program, the type that Steve also talked about. Do you see this trend uh, sort of beyond, beyond just these universities as a larger trend in education? I, I really do believe the universities are very serious and I think what Steve said is is uh, absolutely true is that universities are evolving structures and interdisciplinary programs to work on pro problems, large problems, global problems, of which global health is, is certainly one of them. Um, and what you see on our campus, at least, is true collaboration emerging between schools and colleges that five, ten years ago would not have come together in a room to work together. Uh, Steve's example of a uh, a school of engineering, a school of public health making a joint appointment. People, uh, examples of a school of public health here, uh, uh, a school of management, College of Arts and Sciences coming together to create programs together. Uh, some of it is demand driven by the students and some of it is resonance between the faculty's interests and where they would like to see the university's consciousness go over time. But that resonance is what's creating these programs and I see it growing, not going away. Thank you, thank you very much. As was said in the very first panel, we do, intellectual, we do intellectual capital, we do ideas. You've seen the intellectual capital, we've heard the ideas. We need to continue the conversation on these ideas. We'll do that uh, right now in the next panel, but I hope we'll do that uh, post this event and as we continue discussing not just this report, but the question. Thank you very much. So my name is David Hunter. I'm the Dean for Academic Affairs at the Harvard School of Public Health. And it's really a great pleasure um, to be here and a particular pleasure to moderate this panel introducing some of our future global health leaders. So we've already heard that New England serves as an incubator of uh, ideas in global health, technologies in global health. But as you've probably noticed with just some of the bios of the people who are current leaders introduced uh, so far, we also serve as a major incubator of global health leaders in our universities, hospitals, our uh, NGOs, and industries. And we've got uh, five examples of the next generation of global health leadership from five different New England institutions uh, who've been asked in three minutes or less to talk about their motivations for what they're doing and a little bit about what they're doing. And then we're going to finish with uh, a current leader uh, who is a legend and has provided employment for a lot of the uh, people that we train in the New England area. So without further ado, um, I know time's a bit short, but I actually, I really do want to read the bios that I've been given um, because I think it just provides a spectacular example of the sort of uh, multidisciplinary training and get up and go that uh, a lot of the new generation of global health interested students have. Um, so our first speaker is Amy Bay. Uh, who's a PhD student at the Harvard School of Public Health, I'm proud to say, in the laboratory of uh, Manoj Deer Singh. Uh, a graduate of Harvard College, Amy majored in biochemistry and did her undergraduate honors thesis in the field of uh, plasmodium gametocytogenesis. After graduating, she spent a year in Tanzania at the Mohumbili University College of Health Sciences in Dar es Salaam that I know well, and was a Fulbright scholar there studying uh, plasmodium falciparum, drug resistance and invasion. Uh, she's currently studying falciparum merozoite invasion and immune-related mechanisms of invasion inhibition, working in both Boston and Senegal, and has developed a novel method of conducting reverse genetics in the 
uh, human red blood cell to test the role of erythrocyte polymorphism in plasmodium invasion and growth. Uh, so, Amy, three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here to speak to you today. My foray into the field of tropical disease research occurred in the laboratory of Dr. Jim McCarrow at UCSF, whose lab studies parasitic diseases largely unheard of in the United States, but serious contributors to childhood mortality in developing countries. The need for innovative research in these underfunded diseases intrigued me, and together with my interest in international issues, cultures, and languages, fueled my determination to pursue research in neglected tropical diseases. Over the years, I've studied diseases as diverse as schistosomiasis, trypanosomiasis, and tuberculosis. However, the last nine years of my research have been focused on the causative agent of severe malaria, plasmodium falciparum, from both the laboratory bench as well as the field. At the bench, I've been working to develop novel systems for understanding both parasite and erythrocyte biology. Based on the system we developed, we're currently collaborating with the Broad Institute to screen every gene in the human erythrocyte to identify new targets for therapies aimed at blocking parasite invasion and circumventing antimalarial drug resistance. In the field, in both Tanzania and Senegal, I've been conducting research studying the interaction between the human erythrocyte, the malaria parasite, and the human immune system, disease dynamics which can never completely be understood from a petri dish alone. Integrating these bench and field-based approaches is critical to understanding the important challenges we face in controlling and perhaps one day eradicating malaria. While I enjoy the challenges of research, I have also found a passion in training students and researchers in endemic countries and encouraging their, develop their development into independent scientists. I've worked with our Senegalese Fogarty trainees for the last five years as they come to Boston to study and learn new techniques and experimental approaches. As I've watched the trainees develop their research interests, write their own grants, and go on to lead research projects of their own, I'm reminded that working with these gifted scientists is truly one of the highlights of my career. In addition to one-on-one -on -one mentoring, I've also been involved with a World Health Organization online initiative called Tropica.net. This initiative is aimed at fostering innovation and knowledge application in, ne in neglected disease research and disseminating resources to scientists and the public health community. Using online resources, we've held international journal clubs between Boston and Senegal, allowing us to discuss scientific papers together in real time. And we're planning to start similar journal clubs with Papua New Guinea and Ghana this year. We've reported on malaria workshop held in Dakar, attended by scientists from seven African countries, and we're currently producing a DVD of the workshop and laboratory practical sessions to be made available free of charge, with the hope that it will be a useful tool for the international malaria community. We're discussing plans to launch a conference for outstanding African leaders in malaria research to extend the goal of collaboration, innovation, and leadership, not only in isolated African countries, but within the continent and globally as well. In our goal to create a sustainable solution to the problem of neglected tropical diseases, we must face the challenges with creativity and ingenuity. The integration of innovative research with medicine and intervention, of diligent study with teaching and training of endemic area scientists is both my career ambition and my life passion. It is my hope that this passion will contribute in some small way to building a healthier, safer, and more prosperous world. Thank you. Thank you, and, and Amy just gave us a great example of how one of our new New England institutions, the Broad Institute, has uh, very, very rapidly put its tools and platforms and technologies at the service of global health, a major global health problem. Um, next, we're going to hear from Brian Lublin, who's a senior majoring in biomedical engineering at Boston University. This year, Brian and his senior project partners developed a robust solar-powered pulse oximeter for use by community health workers in Zambia. While at BU, Brian has been actively involved with uh, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, Global Medical Brigades, and Peer Health Exchange. And next year, Brian will begin studies as an MD, MPH student at the UT Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. But we're sure he won't forget that he started his career in New England. Maybe I'll come back someday. We'll see. Uh, so I started getting interested in public health. I think it was my sophomore year. I actually took some classes at the BU School of Public Health and health policy and management and decided I wanted to get a little more involved and get some experience and figure out what it was all about. So I started getting involved with the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program and learned a little bit about advocacy and activity in those ways. And 
from that, decided that global health was more of my interest. I'd read some books, heard some things about Paul Farmer, you know, that guy, and decided that I really wanted to see things on the international scene. So I got involved with Global Medical Brigades and got to go to Honduras last May for eight days. And we traveled around to different villages around Tegucigalpa and set up clinics there, just day clinics, and helped patients with triage and pharmacy activities and did some public health work as well, teaching people about brushing their teeth and washing their hands, some of the stuff we've talked about earlier today. And then senior year comes around, we have to do this little thing called senior project that may be necessary to graduate. And I thought about what I really wanted to do for that and how I could use my future interests in medicine and, and uh, use engineering in that as well. And Professor Zaman, who's my senior project advisor, put up this project that was to develop a solar-powered pulse oximeter for use in developed countries in underdeveloped countries, rather. And that was like, that was it. I knew what I wanted to do. So what we've been working on, uh, for those who don't know, a pulse oximeter is a small device that measures oxygen saturation as well as pulse in a patient's blood. And it can be helpful for community health workers in assessing who, say, has the greatest risk of acute respiratory disease like pneumonia. And from that can guide triage decisions and really uh, allocate resources more effectively. So that's what we've been doing, just turning our paper on Friday. Pretty happy about that. And next, I'm moving to moving to Texas for, for med school. Thank you. So, so that's a great example of the development of appropriate technologies that can really make a difference and save lives. Uh, one of the questions in the earliest panel was, how are we going to pay for all this? And uh, Sarah Pallas, who's currently a PhD student in health policy and administration at Yale University, um, was prior to that Senior Manager for Development, Finance and International, working on projects including the Global Fund five-year evaluation and a public health, public-private partnership uh, creation in Africa, Central Asia, and the Middle East. Previously, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco and then in Togo, where she also worked for Population Services International to help implement a national HIV AIDS prevention program. She holds a MPhil in Development Studies from Cambridge University a BA in Social Studies and African Studies from Harvard University. Thank you. So my interest in global health really began as a Peace Corps volunteer in rural West Africa. I was serving in a village called Kamina, Togo. And in that context, I really observed firsthand some of the devastating consequences of illness for families and individuals. It was a situation that when someone fell ill in a family, they lost their cash reserves paying for medical treatment. They couldn't plant or harvest their crops. They sometimes had to pull their children out of school. And depending on the nature of the disease, they might experience social stigma. We had very limited resources with which to respond to these issues. We had a government health clinic with a single nurse, limited medicines, no equipment. The next nearest clinic was a day's walk away. So the first challenge for me in sort of encountering global health firsthand was, what can I do about this? Where are the resources for this? And where do I go to get help? I discovered in the village that these problems, these health challenges, were really embedded in larger development challenges of agriculture, infrastructure, education, gender, governance. And because these factors were systemic, uh, after my two years in village, I wanted to work with Population Services International, uh, running a national program uh, in Togo funded by the Global Fund. We were working on scale-up of an HIV-AIDS prevention program. I went from working in one village to running a national network of girls empowerment clubs in 40 schools. We trained 1,200 students and female teachers to deliver HIV-AIDS empowerment messages, gender equity messages, prevention messages. And the challenge for me in this move from village to the national program was really one of how you take these tailored interventions these relationships that you've built and invested in, in one community, the political dynamics that you've learned to understand, and now take them to a national level, to 40 sites, to 40 cities, each with their own dimensions. How do you retain the flexibility at the local level while still being accountable to your donor who needs standardized reporting information? When I returned to the US, I took a job with Development Finance International, a business consulting firm. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to work on the Global Fund five-year evaluation, which was a great experience. I also got to work on public-private partnership development, where we were setting up projects between US corporations, multilateral donors, and developing country governments. In these partnership 
uh, projects, as well as with the Global Fund five-year evaluation, I was really discovering that perhaps the strategic place to improve global health was in innovation in the channels of development assistance. In my mind were always these questions from Togo. How do you retain local flexibility and still have global accountability? I decided to return to graduate school to study these questions. I'm currently under Yale's Global Health Initiative, studying health economics, policy analysis, and organizational management. Uh, my hope in the future is to work on applied research about donor aid effectiveness uh, with a donor organization or a think tank. My hope is that the research that I conduct will help contribute to resolution of some of the health challenges that I witnessed in Kamina. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it, it may be a sign of my uh, lack of intellectual development at the time, but sort of 20 or 25 years ago, the idea that economists had too much to help here uh, was strange to me, and uh, we've appreciated over the last couple of decades how critical uh, those decisions that are made around the world, um, informed by economics and health policy, how they really affect life at the grassroots in, uh, in ways that we often can't predict. Uh, Kartik Venkatesh is uh, our next speaker, a native of Ohio, who's pursuing his MD and PhD degrees at Brown University. Uh, currently completing his PhD in clinical epidemiology and has conducted extensive field-based research in clinical settings in both South India and South Africa. Uh, Kardik's particularly interested in the natural history of HIV infection in this era of heart and also primary and secondary HIV prevention, couples-based prevention interventions, and developing effective treatment options for HIV-infected individuals in resource-limited settings. Well, I guess my own uh, interest in global health began when I was global, but it was certainly not health, but was rather examining uh, Sanskrit ritual observances in uh, southern India, doing ethnographic research as an undergraduate at Brown. At the time, um, no doubt, India was going through major social and economic change and flux, but as part of that, I soon began to realize that some of the same communities in which I was conducting very traditional ethnographic research were also being heavily impacted by the growing HIV AIDS epidemic. Since that time, developing an interest in global health, um, Brown was offered a great interdisciplinary forum for me to do my MD degree, but also at the same time to pursue my interest in public health. And having come to global health, I would say, from somewhat of an unconventional approach has been helpful now that as I continue my PhD work, uh, looking at some of the behavioral implications of HIV prevention and treatment, um, certainly understanding the behavioral science and biology is key. But what is also key in many of these settings is understanding local customs. So that being Tamil culture in southern India or local Zulu cultural norms in South Africa, that's also a key part of the puzzle. Um, Brown has been great because it's really allowed me to work with the faculty mentors I want, but also really allowed for student-led research, both at the medical and graduate school level, um, which has really allowed me to pursue my PhD dissertation. Now, kind of nearing the end of the light, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, I hope to continue my work in global health as a physician scientist um, after almost a decade at Brown, so it'll be interesting to see what's next. But what I do know is I want to continue global health research as a physician scientist. And continuing with the theme of the integration of anthropology, sociology into global health uh, imperatives, uh, Claire Wagner is graduating from Dartmouth College this year with a major in medical anthropology. Uh, for the past three years, she served as a research assistant for the director of Dartmouth's Global Health Initiative and worked in Mali, West Africa, on issues of health education and maternal health interventions. Most recently, she conducted a five-month study in urban Tanzania for her thesis, which she's writing up under the guidance of advisors Sienna Craig and Jim Kim. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Hunter. And I'm glad to follow such impressive uh, presentations up here. Um, so I guess my interest in global health dates back to the summer of 2007, my freshman summer, when I stepped off a plane into Bamako, Mali, uh, and was greeted by the NGO employees who I was going to be working with for the next three months at an education-based nonprofit. And they said, 
we saw on your CV that you're trained in emergency medicine. Can you start teaching a course on this tomorrow? Um, and I sort of looked at them blankly, and uh, my, my only training in emergency medicine had been with the Dartmouth Ski Patrol, where healthcare is delivered on the, on the icy slopes in the frozen north, as Steve Hyman said. Um, and here I was in the middle of the Sahara, pretty much, and uh, teaching a health education course. So in that sense, I was doing a lot more learning than I was teaching. And uh, one thing I learned in Mali in my experiences, um, and that's been echoed up here on the panel and in previous panels, is that health outcomes not only affect all aspects of one's life, but all aspects of one's life affect your individual health outcome. And so with that notion in mind, I went back, to, I returned to Dartmouth after that experience in, in Mali to continue studying medical anthropology and global health. So later on at Dartmouth, I, um, I did my research for my senior thesis on the, on the topic of child health and well-being in Tanzania. And the focus of my thesis has been on street children in Dar es Salaam and their perceptions of health risks in everyday life. What I learned from this study was how the social, political, and economic structures define and restrict the choices available to kids to for kids to lead healthy lives. And something that Amartya Sen wrote, a Nobel Prize winning economist, um, he wrote that development is the substantive freedoms that an individual has. And in the case of the street kids in my research, I've learned the importance and the imperative of understanding individual health and individual freedoms within a given socioeconomic context. Recently, I've been increasingly interested in the science of healthcare delivery, something that's been discussed uh, in previous panels. And in fact, this weekend, we, we, uh, a group of us Dartmouth students hosted the first uh, Dartmouth Summit on Healthcare Delivery, where we brought together students from across campus, faculty members, staff, and thought leaders actually from, from the Boston area. Um, and so I hope to pursue these interests in understanding individual health and the socio-political and economic context in which uh, individuals can lead healthy lives um, and integrating that into healthcare delivery. So my, my, career, my career goals are to, are to pursue global health and I'll, I'll see what that entails over the next couple of years. Thanks. Thank you. So so our last speaker, uh, Joel Lamstein, I think illustrates the virtuous cycle we have going here, which is that uh, we train all these wonderful, talented people. Somebody needs to employ them and put them to work around the world. And uh, Joel Lamstein is founder and president of John Snow International, uh, founded in 1978. Uh, John Snow now has more than 1,600 people uh, in the United States and around the world enhancing the lives of underserved and vulnerable populations. In the interest of time, I won't read all the rest of Joel's many uh, honors, awards, and other public service activities, um, but I just want to note that he also co-founded Management Sciences for Health in 1973, one of the other major NGOs in the New England area, um, and he received his BS in Math and Physics from the University of Michigan, but he's an example of somebody uh, really trained and brought to fruition in, the, in New England because he attended the Sloan School of Management at MIT, and I believe he's going to address uh, what employers are looking for um, and how to integrate all this fabulous talent we have into the global health system. Great, thank you. Um, they always have someone up here who has gray hair who's supposed to be smarter, wiser, and older than everyone else on the panel. Clearly, the distinguished panel, you could clear, clearly see that one of those three is right. Uh, I'll let you guess at which, which one those are. Um, one question that was raised quite early is whether students it's, and whether globalization, global health were really an interesting part of uh, students thinking these days. And I can tell you from our perspective by being an employer that uh, the issues of social responsibility are high in the minds of students these days. And that just doesn't relate to the kind of organization that we run but also all organizations. So if you look at uh, what students are looking for, if you want the best talent, you'll find that they're interested in social responsibility, which is not just simply giving money to interesting causes, but in addition to that, to living uh, a, a productive life of making a contribution. 
And whether it's Novartis or Genzyme or IBM, et cetera, the best students are going to go to those organizations that have that kind of characteristic. And we're seeing more and more of that. And uh, as, um, as was said, I started uh, my work in, in around 1973. It was the uh, sort of the end of the 60s and the anti-war movement, et cetera. And it was a very activist time. We're seeing a, a, a revision of that seeing students now who have those same kind of passions that we did at that time. But those students are a lot more knowledgeable than we were, a lot more global, uh, a lot more understanding of what the world is like, partly because of media, but partly because the United States society doesn't look like it did uh, years ago. Now, let me give you just one perspective on uh, how I think about the employment and how we think about the world. JSI, the company I run, is really an organization that does implementation. When you think about what was talked about today, there's really quite a bit of good activity going on in academe. There's quite a bit of good activity going on in policy. But when you get down to actually the execution, who carries it out? I think the commissioner mentioned it. Who actually gets those drugs out there? How do you actually develop health systems? There's less interest in that area, partly because it's less intellectually interesting to some people. Uh, it doesn't have the status. It doesn't have the uh, money associated with it. But our feeling is great to have those good policies, great to have new drugs invented, great to have new vaccines invented. If it never gets down to the villages, it really isn't useful. I just got back from Nigeria, and I can tell you that there are things in Nigeria that look the same now that it looked like 20 years ago. It simply had not gotten down to that area. So our perspective is to find students uh, who are smart enough to do policy, smart enough to do research, but whose orientation is really field orientation. They want to roll up their sleeves and do some systemic changes so that there's an impact at that village level. And... Um, that is really a lot more available now to students. Who we look for are people who are committed to global health. We look for people who have experience in developing countries. We look for people who have analytic skills. One interesting thing is that because of the training at, at BU, at Harvard, at other places, we can find talent in those countries that we work in now. So of our 1,600 people, probably 1,200 actually come from the country or region we work in, and we do not have to compromise on who those students are and who those employees are. They are absolutely first rate. They've been trained in world-class institutions. So for those American students who really want to get involved, they have to have something higher up in the value chain. They have to know something more analytic. They have to be better in monitoring and evaluation. They have to be better in... Uh, IT, all those kind of aspects that are really not found as much in developing countries. The other thing, as I think um, Sarah pointed out, is when you, and, and Claire as well, when you get to these villages, there are multi, multifaceted problems. You're rarely going to work on one thing. And so we look for students who are flexible, who have an analytic background, but are interested in a, in a broader picture of using that background to understand broader issues. So um, rather than just having someone who has a medical background or simply a public health background, someone who has a broader perspective is really necessary because these are such multifaceted uh, problems. The other thing we do, because public health is not just medicine, it's not just sociology, it's not just anthropology, but it's a combination of that, we look for students who are really flexible. We look for this kind of diversity of backgrounds, which will really help us. And also, we look for people who can work in teams. Uh, I think industry is going in that way, but certainly public health is a team-oriented organization, and you simply cannot work in just one area independently anymore. And I think the last thing I would say is, those of, uh, of us who have worked in global health for a long time know how difficult it is. We've worked, as an example, uh, ourselves in Nepal for 20 years working on child health. During that time, they've had several governments. They've had a Maoist revolution going on. Some of the work has gone on. Some of it has stopped. It's very difficult to carry on in a field that is often not highly uh, compensated. 
what we look for are people who have the character, something in their background to, says, to say that they will fight the battle, they will continue on uh, to work in very difficult areas. Just one last point, those, of, those are the people uh, who have done that over the years, I can tell you, have enjoyed public health more than virtually any other field. The fact that, as an example, we are actually delivering one million antiretrovirals per day in Africa makes you feel that you have done something, you've accomplished something. Nothing wrong with making a lot of money, but those of you who are going to public health, you won't. But to go home every day and think that you've changed people's lives, that you've enhanced people's lives, is something that I think is really worthwhile. And we look for people who have that kind of character, that kind of commitment, uh, that kind of passion. Thank you. So I think Joel has really articulated there the uh, passion that we all bring, the opportunities for not just these students, but all the students in the room and outside in engaging in global health. And, uh, and reminded us that in addition to operating at every level, including policy, uh, high-level economics, G20, summits, et cetera, um, many of the specific technologies only can work if they go that last mile to the village or the clinic, uh, the patient, the community. So I think we're running a little bit short on time. So I think I'll ask you to hold your questions for the uh, panelists, uh, maybe until after we break, but I'd like you to ask you to uh, thank them for their <laughs> inspiration. And now I'm going to hand over to Stephen Morrison, um, who is a Senior Vice President and Director of the Global Health Policy Unit at the CSIS. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to just acknowledge uh, how grateful we are uh, to our partners here. This has been really a wonderful experience of working so closely with Boston University and Harvard University and the many friends that we have here. Um, and I just want to name some of them. Jerry Cooch, of course, uh, and Linda McDonald, uh, but also John Douglas and Tara McKee and Bettina Stevens and Scott Bucor and all of the technical support and other uh, friends and students who've, who've helped us in this effort. I want to especially thank on our staff, uh, Emily Poster and Suzanne Brundage. Um, we, um, it's, it's particularly poignant for us, CSIS, which is a, a, an old mainstream foreign policy and, and global security think tank in Washington, founded in the early 60s, um, global health really is not something uh, that uh, is instantly um, identifiable as something we should or can be doing. Um, and we started really in earnest in this field in 2001, uh, in large part because we were in a conversation with Senator John Kerry and Senator Bill Frist about attempting to get a bigger vision forward within the U.S. Senate on what U.S. engagement should be shooting for in its objectives uh, with respect to HIV AIDS and global uh, efforts at bringing therapies uh, and prevention uh, and care on a scale unlike what we had seen before. And that got us in this stream and we felt very good because um, much of the legislative action flowed pretty rapidly out of that and provided, provided much of the foundation for PEPFAR. And several years later, we're now at this point of trying to lay out a broader plan uh, that has a long-term perspective and has some concrete and actionable pieces, and it's just very gratifying to be able to come here and have this kind of discussion. We were a, a bit astonished by the levels of interest. When we rolled this report out on March 18th in Washington, we had over 1,200 people in attendance, half of them in the room and half online. We had over 15,000 downloads of this report in the first week. Um, We've, had, we've created a community through our, our smartglobalhealth.org site of about 5,000 people, mostly university-based, students and faculty, who come forward and offer their comments 
and their suggestions as part of this commission. We appealed to students and faculty in a essay competition, and the report contains four of those essays. We got over a thousand submissions. So it's quite remarkable the level of attention and activism and a feeling of voice and engagement uh, based on universities. And it's very gratifying for us to be able to have these relationships to strike these linkages. Um, the universities are a very strong and natural ally for us. And I just want to appeal to all of you to continue to be engaged and to help us. As we move forward on this commission, uh, there are various streams of work that will flow from it, which will, we will be laying out on the, on the website and through many of our events. And we will be continuing to advertise and appeal to you mm -hmm. to weigh in with your thoughts and your comments. And we'll be calling on some of you uh, in much more concrete and long-term ways to help us in some of the work. Today, we heard a couple of big challenges on the table and in the midst of an enormous amount of optimism, I thought, about the contributions and about the career choices and about the future. Uh, one is how to make the case, um, how to make the case to American citizens and to policymakers and to folks who are struggling with terribly difficult uh, debt, deficit, and unemployment challenges uh, that our country is going through. And I think that the ant there is no simple answer to making the case, but I think we're beginning to see the outlines of that. One is to measure and prove the impacts in a much more serious fashion than we have up to now. Another is to integrate our efforts. We're attempting to move forward on maternal and child health and family planning alongside the existing initiatives. We're attempting to move ahead with building much stronger partnerships with, our, with the governments themselves that, that of the countries in question, and we're attempting to reach Americans in a new way. Uh, we're also saying that the White House and others need to take a long-term strategic approach and lead the American public. And I think all of those things are possible in making the case for building out over the next 15 years, but it's by no means assured. I think we, it's fair to say that we're in a big transition moment. We've had huge successes, but there's lots of tensions. We've heard some of the questions around, are we slowing the growth of antiretroviral treatment and the enl enrollments of people in need? We ha they those, those growth rates have slowed, but one of the things we tried to hammer home is the need to preserve a momentum, a sense of growth and momentum and forward motion on HIV, TB, and malaria while moving ahead in these new initiatives on maternal and child health and ham family planning. We are, I think, at some risk of, of not being able to preserve the core and foundational bipartisanship if we're not very careful. Um, we deliberately mixed in our uh, commission four members of Congress, two from the Senate, two from the House, and two from each party. Um, and, and, that, and that was for a very real point, which is that we've had exceptional bipartisanship over the last decade, and we need to keep that front and center <coughs> in how we how we move, a for, move ahead. There were a lot of questions raised about where will the jobs be, where will the markets be, where will the new discoveries come from, but I think the answers are really here in this room that many of you are going to be actively involved in attempting to answer those questions. Um, I just want to close with one a special thank you to Senator Shaheen and to, and to um, Karen Remley and Peter Lamptey, our commissioners who've been with us and who've come up here today. So with that, um, thank you so much, and uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>